With their project Kuiper, Amazon is becoming a competitor of the Starlink satellite-based internet from SpaceX. They're not a competitor in a launch. That's Blue Origin, that which is, you know, although it's owned by Jeff Bezos, it's a completely separate company. But Project Kuiper does compete with the Starlink internet satellite communications business that SpaceX has. And as a reminder, SpaceX wanted to build that business because it's a much bigger business than the launch business. So they needed something. If they're going to pay to go to Mars, they need a cash. And so one way to do that is to build a much bigger business than the launch business. And actually, Starlink, it was probably like a, a $10 billion kind of project, too, over a period of years. Kuiper, you would expect them to have higher costs, partially just because of inflation and partially because the rockets they were using. Anyway, Project Kuiper, it is satellite-based internet service like Starlink. They finally got a launch back in October 6th, and within about 30 days, they concluded it really was a success. Everything worked out the way it was supposed to, meaning the satellite, the propulsion for raising and lowering orbits work, the actual transmissions, and in particular, they demonstrated 4K video streaming, two-way video calls, and also buying something on Amazon Prime. Of course, they had it. If you're gonna be Amazon, you know, you're just offering uh, an easier way for more people to buy stuff. Satellites that went up. There was a question on the rocket used for the test flight. They went up on an Atlas V. I guess nobody really knows how tightly they're going to pack them, but in theory, that probably could have held 20 to 25 of their satellites. But they were so desperate. The problem with them was they bought up all the spare capacity for rockets that haven't actually yet flown. You know, the, uh, the Ariane 6, which is not actually ready yet in Europe, you know, and Blue Origin just doesn't exist yet. And also the Vulcan out of the United Launch Alliance. All these are rockets that have not actually flown yet, and that's where they bought up all their launch capacity. So we'll get to that, because it turned out they finally broke down and ordered a couple from SpaceX as well. But anyway, so they're demonstrating the satellite works. Deployment is really going to begin in earnest now. Mass production of the satellites is going to start in December. They got a factory in Kirkland, Washington. Launches should start in the first half of 2024, and with beta testing of the users late 2024. Now, that's their schedule. You know, I don't know if they can meet that or not, because it takes quite a few satellites to make a reasonable beta test. And it's kind of questionable if they could actually get that many up very fast. They have about 3,200 some satellites that have to go up there, and they have to get half of them up by 2026. So Kuiper, as I said, is internet service from satellites. Very similar to Starlink, but there are some differences. One difference is that they're really pushing integration with Amazon Web Services, that, since they own that, and the infrastructure. And that's something that actually is sort of a vertical integration issue. That's something that SpaceX doesn't really have. They're working independently with other companies like Google and others for some of that internet infrastructure tie-in. The other thing is they already had some ground stations in place. They were trying to set up a ground station as a service kind of a thing. They already had six in existence. They use the words ground station, and to most people that just means communication between a satellite and the ground is the equipment to do that, something beyond what a user would do. And 12 is not enough. Maybe you could cover the U.S. with that. Starlink has at least 20 at this point. But, you know, starting off, they would have had fewer, and so maybe that's okay. But there's the whole rest of the world. And with their architecture that I'll talk about in a minute, they really can't talk or do anything over the Internet without having ground stations nearby. A ground station, in the case of Starlink, it covers a footprint of roughly a circle of, say, 700 miles, some, something in that range. And... You know, you imagine, okay, 12 of those, you, you could place them around the country and you'll probably cover most of at least the continental U.S., probably not Hawaii and Alaska, but at least you could get that. But anyway, minor differences, they have slightly higher orbits, but they're still pretty much in low Earth orbit, not that different. We talked about hollow effect thrusters the last time for some deep space stuff, but all the satellites pretty much use them. Um, they're using Krypton in theirs, and that's like the previous generation for Starlink, because Starlink moved on to Argon, which will cost 1% of what Krypton costs. A question came up on the effectiveness of Argon. Isn't its reaction mass less than Krypton? It is, and yet when Starlink people did this, they ended up doing a more powerful engine somehow or other. So somehow or other, they advanced the technology. But there may be a bigger difference from Starlink, at least initially. Apparently, they don't have any links between the satellites. Now, actually, Starlink didn't either in the beginning. They always said they would, but they couldn't get it together in time. So they've launched quite a few satellites without them. Maybe Amazon is just doing the same thing. You can't tell from their public announcements. They have all kinds of nice drawings of what's going to happen with their system. None of them show any links between the satellites. And it turns out that actually has a big impact. So maybe they'll do it later, just like the Starlink people did. In the case of Starlink, they say they have about 8,000 links right now, which means laser-based communications between two satellites. 
you'd have to have at least two. You'd probably want to always go for in the same orbital plane, like think of a big circle full of uh, multiple satellites. You'd always want to shoot out to the one ahead of you and the one behind you. So you'd need at least two per satellite. You probably want another two for going to the side. So you'd probably have four per satellite. I don't actually know what they're doing, but that would say maybe 1,200 satellites already have this out of the 5,000. So it's a significant proportion, but it's not complete. Now, one thing Amazon did say is they are going to have some laser links to U.S. military satellites. And that's because there's this program we talked about a couple months ago, the Space Development Agency, which is part of the military. They're setting up constellations of satellites with laser-based communications, and they're going to have a standard for that. And I guess Amazon has said they will participate in that. So they're not afraid of doing it. And I think in their early FCC filings, they mentioned it in passing, but it's not obvious that they're doing it right away. Anyway, why is this important? And really, this is what this picture is all about here. Here's the standard case that everybody expects to be using, or the Amazon wants to use. Left-hand side here, you got a user. Maybe it's somebody in their house, maybe it's a business, or it could be a cell tower for a phone company that's just isolated and not connected to the internet in any way, out in some remote area. They're making a point on their website of advertising that particular case. So that would communicate with a satellite and then back down to a ground station. At that point, that's tied into the internet, in particular, the Amazon Web Service infrastructure. But the key thing is really the internet. So from there, you can go to other users. I've labeled a thing called service over there. That might be Netflix, or it might be just a web server somewhere. Some kind of a, a service you're using. Or it could be another user, a business or anything else. And we're showing and they also could be remote on another terminal, as is shown on the right-hand side diagram there. So the yellow links are microwave links between ground and satellite. The red are internet. You can see a path here. You kind of bounce up and down to the satellite or all on the internet, back up to a satellite and down to some other user. Or just communicate with somebody on the internet, either way. The catch with that is it says you have to have a ground station, which means if you want to cover the world with service, you can have a lot of ground stations, lots and lots. And that's the weakness of this particular system, which is why in Starlink or even the old Iridium system, why they had satellite links so they can bypass all this. Large areas are just not reachable, like the ocean. What are you going to do for the ocean? I'll get to that in a minute. You can use ships, but it's uh, pretty iffy. Now, this is the traditional model. For TV broadcasters, if you were direct TV or, or you know, one of these people, you were up way up in, in geosynchronous orbit, 22,000 miles up. There's a long time delay between that satellite and any customer. But for broadcast TV, it doesn't make any difference. I mean, if you're getting it some milliseconds longer, it doesn't really make much difference. But it makes a difference in a lot of internet applications. I mean, imagine people playing video games, getting a huge lag, you, know, you just can't do it. Those satellites, instead of being at like a couple hundred miles up, like the, the low Earth orbit ones, they're up at 22,000 miles. That's a factor of 100. And the time delay is just proportional. It really matters. So that was sort of the old model. And it looks like they may be following that, at least initially. So there's a question then, well, what other cases are supported? Can you just go from one user to another just through a satellite? Probably they wouldn't do that. Now, in theory, you could, but there are some issues, not so much related to communication, but it's more related to authenticating the users in the first place. I mean, you could put in memory easily every user and their passwords. You can take care of that. But billing and handoffs from satellite to satellite, it's just harder. You can do it. Because keep in mind, these satellites, they were shown in an orbit here. They're going along over these users. They're only in view of a particular user for maybe seven minutes or so. And that's horizon to horizon. And actually, usually there's trees and stuff and buildings in the way. So you have to have an angle. So actually, you don't really get the full distance. But anyway, building, you could imagine you do it the way you do store and forward networks. Where basically, the satellite would remember that somebody was on that call. It's going to move on down, and eventually it'll pass by a ground station. It could then transmit, oh, that that user some time ago, sometime during this previous orbit, had communicated. And so they could keep track of that, but it's just messy. And then the handoffs. It says you'd have to have extra logic, actually, in the user terminals to keep track of, oh, by the way, I've got an ongoing video stream or call going on. My previous satellite is passing overhead. Here comes the new one. And, you know, you could do it, but it's harder. So we'll just say, we're not sure about that. Now, what about repeaters? You could say, well, okay, like, suppose you just want to go over the border into Canada, you know, from a U.S.-based ground station. You could imagine if you had, even if for some reason, a remote area of Canada, maybe they wouldn't have any internet access, but you could put a couple of extra ground stations in there just basically to bounce the signals around. You could imagine doing that. And it does consume a lot of capacity, though. If you want to reach this guy from over there and vice versa, 
you've got to go through all these intermediate stations, which means there's that many fewer users each one can handle. So it's, it's sort of iffy, but it could be done. But actually, you can't tell. Amazon isn't really giving that level of detail as far as I know. The downside of all this is you get a lot of time delay because not only do you have the extra length, instead of just going like, say, from satellite to satellite, you go up and down and up and down. There's more distance, which translates to more time delay. But also there's more repeaters. Every time you go through one of these nodes of any type, it's got to be converted from, say, optical or, or radio frequency. Essentially, you're dealing with a router there, essentially dealing with electronics, computing, you know, and it, it does some stuff on the computer and then it reformats that and then sends it along to the next link. That all takes time. Every time you have a repeating unit of any type, it takes extra time. And so the more of those repeaters you have, the worse off you are. The ideal situation would be you know, whenever you can, you pass the signals between the satellites. Those are different transmitter receiver pairs. They don't interfere with the normal links. So you got a guy over here talking, you, you skip as many intermediate ground stations as you possibly could by the inner satellite links. And those, if they're laser based, they're much, much faster. That's the Starlink vision. That was even the old Iridium vision, which is the, the granddaddy of all these. The difference though, is that these links, these are laser based. Nowadays, they're laser based. Actually, you can carry a lot more data with lasers. It just basically is higher frequency. Light is higher frequency than microwaves. So you can squeeze a lot more in. And another factor is that the speed of light in space is a lot higher than the speed of light in say optical fiber which is what's on the ground there. So you actually want to bypass the ground infrastructure as much as you can. Now, from an economic standpoint, if you're trying to minimize the number of satellites, it kind of goes the other way. But, you know, in terms of, just in terms of delay time, basically you'd rather have most of it just go through space. So uh, anyway, those are the kind of issues that you can't quite tell what Amazon is actually doing here. Anyway, they're going to start off with something and they're just not saying all the details. The interesting part about Amazon here is that they finally decided to go for Falcon 9 for some of their launches of their satellites. I think they were kind of forced into it because some of their own shareholders sued them saying, you know, you guys, you didn't go for the cheapest launches, which would be SpaceX. They definitely beat everybody else. They have availability and the others didn't, including Blue Origin, which is one of the Bezos companies. So there was a lawsuit about that. I think ordering three launches is slightly more than just token. Is it probably perfectly calibrated? You know, if you just got one launch from SpaceX, you know, that would say, okay, that's just a token effort to shut down the lawsuit. So, but you do three, it sounds a little more convincing. The other hand, it is probably something they absolutely need to do to meet their license requirements. They've got to get a lot of satellites up and they're really the only show in town at this point is SpaceX. Because they have reusable boosters, they can get a lot more stuff up to orbit. Nobody else can do it. They just can't maintain that kind of launch cadence. The, the cadence is the word they like to use, just meaning high frequency use. And there's actually another factor a lot of people have pointed out, and that's that probably Amazon won't actually meet their deadline to get half their satellites up by 2026. So what they'll do is they'll file for an extension. And if they've already clearly made efforts to at least alleviate the launch shortage, that kind of takes care of that problem too. So I think they in reality need to do this and in fact, it solves several legal problems along the way. So it's all good for them. As a result now, actually every single Starlink competitor uses SpaceX, every one. The only one that doesn't is DirecTV, but they're not launching anything. But that includes the other direct competitors, which are this first line here, the, the OneWebs, the O3Bs, uh, Telesat, which is coming along. They haven't launched yet. That is a Canadian operation. There's the old line geosynchronous satellite providers and the ones that are more focused on voice communications. All of them have launched on SpaceX. They just have no choice. Other space related videos or slide presentations by me are available at the link shown here. That includes a web page and also a list of videos at my YouTube channel. So you can view them or subscribe for notifications about future videos. These presentations are mostly made as part of the meetings of National Space Society's North Houston chapter, and the link to that is shown. Topics like these are presented as part of a monthly news segment, and there are also lots of other interesting speakers and open discussions. You can attend in person or online via Zoom. Come join us.